And next up, uh, we have one of our sponsors, but actually he reached in just through the normal CFP process, so he didn't buy that slot. Um, but he's actually running a great Wi-Fi for us, and, but he's also running bigger Wi-Fis, and he'll talk to you all about uh, the challenges in doing so. So please welcome Nils Dose. Um, hi, from my side. Um, my name is Nils Dose. I'm from uh, Kiel, which is about an hour north from here. Um, I'm here between uh, you and probably your first beer, so we're going to get started. Um, I will talk to you about challenges running large-scale public Wi-Fi's and a little bit about toilet paper. So first great news, since about an hour we have Wi-Fi on the toilets. <laughs> because it was um, requested. <laughs> <laughs> Not from me. Okay, so let's get started. Um, little agenda is same as always. Um, I'm a father of three children. I'm nearly 40. I work in Kiel. And uh, when you think too much at work, you have to break something, and well, that works better when you have bigger machines. So um, I like driving these. Um, I work at Edix Internet Services. Uh, we do a lot of stuff. Um, we will skip that because we have no time. Um, so let's uh, see what's coming next. Um, about four years ago, I was standing in the morning at um, DNOC 7. Uh, and uh, took you out of the data center and said, well, climb up, up this ladder and look back down to do some wireless stuff. Uh, we still have these guys climbing that high, but it brings challenges um, mounting access points so high, so um, we mount them a little bit lower. Um, we talked to a lot of people. We're waiting for some internship applications for people who want to try that with us. Um, well. Um, when DNOC 7 finished, I got home, and probably everybody of you knows something like that. Um, we have a local newspaper, and they were running some Wi-Fi hotspots in the city, and uh, they were not performing as well. We were, performing, uh, we were running some hotspots for customers that requested it, but um, not as good and not at scale as we'd like to do that, so we decided um, to uh, take over the Wi-Fi network of the newspaper and um, look at it and um, make it perform well. Um, when you're running Wi-Fi networks, um, you have a lot of challenges to solve. I want to look a little bit in some parts, not into technical deep dive. Um, there are some talks about that I can point you to later. So I'm going to see that. Um, when you look at the situation of free Wi-Fi in Germany, um, basically there was a time there was no free Wi-Fi. There's um, Freifunk, they're doing a great job, um, but um, there was not a solution. So when you come somewhere, you have to ask for the Wi-Fi password, you have to log in, you um, get some nasty splash pages, um, and so on. So um, the legislation was changed a little bit, so it's getting better and better. Um, you're getting more and more Wi-Fi. There is um, Wi-Fi for um, EU, um, European Union project um, where people are building up Wi-Fi networks. Um, we have no clue where that heads because there are some um, legal requirements that the European Union demands um, the people that take the money from the EU to uh, um, build the Wi-Fi networks. Um, so you have a lot of different hotspots, and you're not sure if there's a hotspot where you're going. Um, data plans, plans got better, but um, when you look at uh, students and uh, at school and so on, uh, they don't have as big data plans as we have, um, and they are the primary users of free Wi-Fi. Um, next point is trustworthiness. When you do, you log in into every Wi-Fi free Wi-Fi you find. Um, around, or do you think, do I really need this? Who is running that, and what data are they actually looking at? Because you hand the data of your device to the provider or to the, the people running this Wi Fi network. Um, so, do you really encrypt all your data your phone is sending over a public hotspot? Just to think about it. Um, when building public Wi-Fi at scale, um, you get to the point that it has to be paid. Someone has to pay the hardware, someone has to pay 
your monthly wage, someone has to pay all the other stuff you need around electricians, mounting, access points, and so on. Um, so you need some kind of sponsors um, running these networks uh, that give you the money to run it. Um, more and more companies see um, Wi-Fi as a service for their customer. So you're not talking to the IT department anymore um, that is responsible of Wi-Fi, so, but you're talking to the marketing people um, that have the money for this Wi-Fi network, but they have completely different goals than the IT people. Um, the marketing people have uh, interesting demands. They want to interact with their customer. They want to see stuff they're probably not allowed to see, but they'd like to have. Um, and it comes, many of these things they want to have um, went away in the last years. Um, Apple um, pushed their captive network assistant, which is basically a simple browser that does not support um, JavaScript and a lot of other things. Um, Google with Android has the same thing, um, even worse for the marketing people, because once you give the device internet access, uh, the splash browser just went away and the device doesn't care about it anymore. Well, Google doesn't need the data you can capture there because they still have uh, they already have it, but probably the marketing people want to have it. Um, other options are uh, killed by GDPR. Um, and uh, so, ask sales and marketing what they want to have and um, get them back to the ground what they actually can get. So, but all of this stuff is mostly not a technical problem I can solve. Um, it's more problem, um, I can't change the Android operating system and um, I can't change GDPR, so basically it's not my problem. Um, what we see when running public Wi-Fi networks is that it's not all about uh, the end user, so private people being in the public utilizing Wi-Fi networks. What we also see is large companies deploying zero trust, uh, trust IT, IT concepts on um, cloud-only systems. So they move to Office 365 and don't care about how the peer, their users actually get there. Um, so they make their users work on public Wi-Fi networks in the company. They take, rip out all of the IT, just put in Wi-Fi, um, and the users are still able to work, but they cut away this whole complexity layer on, um, of their IT systems. Um, it's a good idea, but we had the encryption part. Most of the cloud stuff is encrypted, okay, um, but there are still some people running IMAP over uh, unencryptedly over open Wi-Fi networks. Um, WPA3 um, over E will solve that because then um, the Wi-Fi traffic will be encrypted, but at the moment um, it is not there yet. There are test versions, there might be some test clients, but um, well. Um, as I said in the beginning, we started out building, taking over a public Wi-Fi network in, in March 2016. Um, it was announced that we take over the city. Um, the colleagues from the other provider of the city are here. They were smiling at, at us, saying, well, we have more. Um, yeah, might be in the city, no, but not in the state. Um, the state of the union is that we deployed um, um, about two and a half thousand access points in the state of Schleswig-Holstein. So this was the area on the map before. Um, about one third of them is outside, uh, two thirds is inside at customer sites. Um, we have about 750 to about a thousand new users every day. Uh, we have um, 1.12 million users in the last three years using this network. Um, we have about 100,000 unique users each week um, doing over 1.5 million sessions um, and a lot of traffic. Um, if you want to more, know more about this stuff, talk to me later on, I'm around. Um, what we see is during the daytimes, um, they come and go when you look at the graph. Um, the blue line on top is um, the unique users over a week, so about a time of seven days. On the weekend, it's a little bit lower. 
during weekdays a lot more. Um, we equip um, schools, we equip buses, um, public transportation, um, bus stops and all that kind of stuff. Um, which makes mounting really interesting because when you bring, want to bring hardware into public transportation, you have to fulfill certain legal requirements for devices that you can actually mount there because when it gets into a car accident and starts burning or so on, it gets a little bit difficult. Um, all things you have to think about and you have to have people that actually can build these devices that you can put in there or at least find the devices that you're allowed to put in there and bring them together so you can easily mount and maintain them. Because in public transportation, if the Wi-Fi in a bus stops working, you have probably the chance to, get, to enter the bus on one bus stop, replace the device and exit on the next one. But if the buses don't run, they don't earn money. Um, I said I want to talk about toilet paper. So when you go over or the organizational challenges with Wi-Fi, um, the marketing people and so on want to interact with the users. Um, the concept we started with was that you can, you, we show the splash page, the welcome page, only once. Um, we store the MAC address of the device and once it comes back, it always gets through. So they will not see the splash page anymore. That makes it really uninteresting for marketing people. Um, you have to match marketing expectations and technical reality and somehow find a way between. So there are options to show splash pages more or less, so every couple of days. But the more you do such thing, um, the less you can, the more you can interact with the user and so show different stuff depending on where they are and, and how, how they often they get back. Um, but the less or the worse the usability of the network gets. So when you come somewhere and you have to, oh, you have to basically take out your phone, go to the Wi-Fi, log in, hit the splash page. Um, you will not do it anymore after the third time. So it just has to work. Um, home is where Wi-Fi is, so where your Wi-Fi just works and you don't have to care about. And um, the toilet paper comes from that I went to marketing and said, uh, well, let's talk about shitty Wi-Fi. And so they got back with the toilet paper. When you look into the technical part, and you start out with a very small solutions, you have to think about how large will I be able to scale that. Um, when you look at the different systems, they might work well when you have 10, 5, 50, 100 APs. They are bigger solutions for enterprises with multiple sites, um, but they will, will they meet your technical demands? I don't care about WPA, enterprise encryption, login mechanisms and so on. I care about um, displaying splash pages, being able to run different captive portals depending on sites, getting accounting data in time, not three minutes after the user already left my network. Um, when you want to do something on the login pages with this data, it has to be there once you need it. So will it fit, fit your need? What requirement does um, the, the different departments give you um, and what kind of challenges from the networking perspective do you have to solve? Is the solution scalable and can, can you interact with it in a programmable way? You don't want to handle two and a half thousand more access points by hand. It's a mess. When you look at the system and want to see how the data is handled, um, you have basically the solution about islands and um, a central overlay. The island solution is basically about putting a Wi-Fi router in each home, giving them all the same names and the same password, and the traffic exits each internet access link. But when you have a house with five or ten apartments and all name the Wi-Fi the same, and might be they also have the same internal IP address for the router, that might work but not always, um, when you move around the house. 
um, so this is all about roaming and do islands overlap? When an island with the Wi-Fi overlaps with another and people roam between infrastructures, you have to ha have some central mechanism in, um, where to take the data along. Um, if you have 100 um, Fritz boxes or something like that, how do you manage them? Can you get to them once they're deployed somewhere at a customer network behind some firewall or anything like that? Can you get to these devices and actually manage them? Um, there is not the one or the other solution. Um, you somehow have to combine them. So when you go for a central solution with an overlay network, um, you must be able to integrate the island solutions become, because you come to sites where you already have Wi-Fi and you have to somehow integrate with them. They might put up um, SSID for you and hand you the traffic on a link, but then you have to somehow integrate that into your whole other solution. Um, running overlay changes, uh, overlay networks is a complete different um, chapter on that stuff. Um, it, it brings some downsides. So you need big central gateways because you have 10,000s of users on a central gateway. Uh, and if that gateway breaks, well, all the users call you. Um, all the traffic is backhauled to your data center. You need to be able to handle that traffic. Um, well, don't let's talk about MTU. Path MTU discovery is broken on about 10% um, of all internet access links we see. Uh, at the moment, um, and you have to cope with that, or the system at least has to be able to cope with that. Um, most Wi-Fi vendors support some type of CAPWAP, LWAP, whatsoever, tunneling to backhaul the traffic to your local data center. But as we had before, you have to somehow um, integrate third parties. Um, every Wi-Fi needs a cable. Um, at least some power. You can run mesh networks, and it has some downtimes, but we'll see it later on. Um, but you need internet, you need power. Or you need some LTE, but then you still need power. Um, your Wi-Fi can't be better than your internet connection. It can't do any magic. Um, there are some internet connections you're not allowed to run public networks on. So you have to think about that. There. Are, um, data contracts for mobile phones that do not allow public hotspot usage, you have to negotiate about that. Um, you can run access points using mesh technology and to extend your coverage, but you have to know the limits of it. And the power, still. Um, there are some ideas about running it autonomously. We have a lot of wind up in northern Germany. We have a little bit of some sun, sun times, but you need a lot of batteries. You have to place, place them somewhere. Running um, mesh networks can help you to extend the coverage of your network. Um, mesh is basically, when I'm standing here and someone in the back can't understand me, that someone in the middle basically receives what I'm talking, turns around, and tells the guys behind. Um, but as long as the guy in the middle is talking, I can't talk. So we basically half the speed. You can do multiple hops in behind each other, but it will get slower and slower and slower. If you don't have a lot of users, that's fine. If you have a lot of users, better take cables. Um, the mesh of most vendors runs on five gigahertz. There are some systems when, that can do it on 2.4, which is um, less attractive um, because there are even less channels available. Um, the path selection depends on the vendor. Some use spanning tree. It's a great idea, but doesn't work. <laughs> the path selection is um, interesting and slow. Um, we have ferries running um, in our harbor, so passengers can, passengers can get on and off it. And we have Wi-Fi access points all around the water. So we said, well, when we put just a Wi-Fi access point on, on the ship, it will mesh to one and then to the other one, and it will work great. 
Well, the ferry was about half an hour out on the water till the access point decided to look for some other uplink. Um, mesh networks can help you to build redundancy for uplinks. Um, so if the uplink access point or the, the root access point breaks, um, you, you are able to, or the access point will look for a different uplink, uh, but will it go back? Um, and what will the, the other access point do where the router failed? It will hook back up. And when the router comes back up, both networks are bridged. And then you have, well, one customer and another customer with a bridged network internally. And then the one customer gets IP addresses from the other, and everything is slow. Interesting problems to debug. When you mount access points, um, you can mount them high or you can mount them low or somewhere in the middle. It, I really don't care where to mount them as long as you have the technical options to get the cable there because that's the biggest problem. The access point will work better when it's lower and it will also work when it's high. But as long as you don't get internet and power there, it doesn't help. When you are at the customer, you have to cope with their infrastructure. This picture up there on the top right was taken on October 20th this year, and this, this device is in production. Yes. <laughs> okay, so when you get there to hook up an access point, you just run away. It's great when the tenant of a building says, well, you can mount the access point there, and then you start drilling, and then someone is yelling at you why you're damaging his building because they didn't talk to each other, but who has to talk to the building owner? And when you talk to building owners, they always get these dollar signs in their eyes because they know all the mobile operators that come there and want to put antennas. And they put money on the table, um, and they put money on the table more each year because they don't want to have discussions with the building owners. We don't want to put much money on the table for mounting and dam access point. Coming to the operational part, um, managing access points is easy. You hook them up to the controller, they will find, find the controller. Um, you put them in a group and if a decent network engineer somehow did his job, they will work. So if the system is up and running, the engineers will not have to do anything with the Wi-Fi network and say it's can do their stuff and sell access points and you're out. This is great. But your infrastructure has to support it and you have to give these guys the tools to actually do that. Um, they also have to be able to help the customer if they call if you don't have a special help desk. My team supports business customers. If they are, if they, now I have 100,000 users each week and some of them start calling my people will throw me into the water. Um, you have to somehow bring up a system that provisions all these steps and that gives your internal departments the view on the data they need and that gives the customer the option to see. If a customer hooks up an access point to his internal network um, and the Wi-Fi shows up, then you just give him a website where he can see, yeah, why your Wi-Fi is running fine and you have 10, uh, 10 users in the last hours and 100 in the last day. They will not call you, they will be happy and they will give this data to marketing. And if you draw them some graphs on how many users are there, they also can see when they put some advertisement somewhere, if it gets more or less. It just works. Wi-Fi is where home is, and if Wi-Fi doesn't work, people go to their mobile data op uh, phone operator and take their network, so they will not tell you that it's broken. You somehow have to measure it. You're in a public environment, and the customer expects performance like on a home network when he is living in a single apartment somewhere in the woods with no other Wi-Fi around, but you're outside in the public in a crowded street. Um, 
so you have to somehow get your users to that expectation that it will not perform as they're as the same when they are home. When you limit bandwidth, ports, anything like that, it will break the customer experience. And will it really help to prevent traffic, DDoS, or spam? Not really. The other question is, you have to notice if something breaks because they will not tell you. You normally don't interact with the end user of the public Wi-Fi network. If they call you, you can put them into three categories. The one is the people complaining about everything. Just have, well, they are there, you can't get rid of them. The second one is, didn't find an English word for that, alu träger, so, uh, okay. Um, afraid of radiation. Um, when we started up with our, our thing, with the newspaper, they had um, uh, an hour on the telephone where people could call me and they had a reporter next to me, and we had three people calling. The one was an Android 2 not being able to configure Wi-Fi. The second one wanted to tell us that it works great, and the third one uh, called because she couldn't go into the city anymore because of the radiation, and then she always fell over. And we asked her where she went. We didn't have any Wi-Fi there. <laughs> we had the same thing in the, in the afternoon, and because we didn't took her serious, her husband called. <laughs> that was the only caller in the afternoon. <laughs> okay. I talked to marketing and wanted to have something for shitty Wi-Fi. So they gave me this picture and I also have animations and all that kind of stuff. We're thinking about putting them, them on t-shirt, not for earning money, but if you'd like a t-shirt, <laughs> talk to me later on. Um, we're not sure which uh, text to put on that. So we're pretty much at the end. Um, we all run networks and we are all get in touch with Wi-Fi. Um, bringing up great or making basically Wi-Fi great again and make it a great experience for us your users. Don't shape them, allow them to work on it and take them serious when they have problems. Uh, and then it will all work out. One other thing marketing came up. When you turn it, you know how it looks. I hope that works. Marketing. OK. We have two minutes for questions. Anyone? All right. Matthias Walter from Freifunk Münsterland. At the scale you run the public Wi-Fi's, how much do you struggle with requests for lawful interception? Um, about once a week. Um, I have about, uh, yeah, well, there are two. One is for, for um, the Störerhaftung um, Bestandsdatenauskunft. Um, we get that about once a week. And um, I had, in the last three years, three cases of basically major crime, like murder or so, where they'd like to have data. We just work together with them, because mostly they are people, you can talk to them, and they don't have any technical knowledge. It is a problem, but you can um, give some knowledge to them, and they will work with it. But then they come back with a piece of paper signed by a, a Richter, sure. um, and, they, and then they want data from a week, and so, yeah, well, no. <laughs> Thank you. Sylvan here from Open Factory. One more question um, about the meshing. Uh, do you have any experience in terms of uh, Wave 2, if that's uh, going to be a bit better, because that's multi-user MIMO, so that should get at least the throughput up? Um, we started with AC Wave 1 um, that worked quite well with the vendor you, we use. Um, there was no difference to Wave 2. What we have is um, problems with uh, DFS. We're located at the water. The rain radar is not that far away. 
um, you have to cope with that. Hi, Kurt Kaiser. Uh, question about IPv6. Do you run it dual stack or single stack? Um, we run single stack v4 um, because the captive portal solution doesn't support it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, if that's it for questions, then have fun. Have a beer. Have a beer. Thank you very much, Niels. If you want to get in touch. Okay. okay, and we'll see you back in a bit. Thank you.